15 years. So I've asked Jim to speak on, you know, as a chairman or as a former CEO, how does he look at risk and how is he as the chairman of the board of inquest supposed to understand what's going on? And I can give you a clue, you know, ask lots of questions, challenge everything that's happening and make sure you have good people around you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Greg, for that uh, introduction. I, uh, Greg asked me to talk, and um, I wasn't sure of what the audience would be or what the, you know, how to approach it. So uh, I have a, a presentation here which addresses some of the risk issues, but the, the meat of it is about shale, gas, and fracking, basically in the US and Canada. And there's a lot of really good information here, and um, uh, there are, I'm hope I'm talking to people who, who will appreciate the information. I have some uh, comments on what, what little I saw this morning, and those are these. So of, I've been chairman of a board for four years or so. I've been on boards for more than that. I've been CEO for 16 years, and so. Um, Broadly speaking, boards have no expertise whatsoever, and uh, also they're not interested. So if you go up and say porosity, you're out. Okay, so um, they're checking timetables and trains and so on and so on. You laugh, I laugh, but it's true. And in, in, in particular in BP Canada, there was not one person with any technical background. Okay, so another comment is that uh, I've, investors are not owners. They think they're owners, they're not owners. They're renters. They're like people who just squat in a house for a bit and move on. The people who, who own it are the, are the management. They, that's their life. They own it. We had a little discussion about uh, owns, you know, what percentage should you own in a field. Uh, my view was you've got to have 80% plus. Then you win all the votes. You know, and you don't, and you can plot your own future. Topic for another time. Of course, climate changes. It's unrelated to CO2, and we can talk about that some other time, maybe. Uh, we talked about somebody uh, talked about sell side analysts in the U.S. At least they are disenfranchised. So who pays for them? You pay for them, or the the, the they've got buy side analysts. So these sell side analysts are dying breed. The other, there was a discussion about what goes wrong in uh, big companies. My, my conclusion there is the three-year job cycle. So your function in a, in a big company is to improve your own career, which is get out of this three-year job without messing up. And somebody, a guy from Ryder Scott, came to tell me and said, in Exxon, if your reserves go down two years in a row, you're fired. So I said, well, that, you know, they must be really conservative. And he said, no, 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 they're just liars. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, pr this is a very familiar sort of thing I just put up there too. There's political risk, there's economic risk, there's technical risk, and you know, broadly speaking, it's above ground and below ground. But the main thing is, in my experience, if the rocks don't work, you're finished. It doesn't matter what the rest do if, you, if the rocks don't work. So that is the most important thing. So I'll address these things in turn. Uh, political risk, the most political risky uh, countries that we thought in Talisman, we were in 28 countries, was the UK and the US. The most reliable were Cuba, Sudan, places like that. They were very legalistic. You've got an agreement, that's an agreement. <coughs> it was not true in the US. So, um, or, or the UK. The UK has 28 rule changes, tax changes, in you know, as many years, um, the uh, I'm just trying to think of the attorney gen New York attorney general. He was on the take. He, uh, he I'm going to sue your company unless you give me some money. It was just like that. Okay, um, I had a very simple rule: China and Russia just don't go there. That you know, keeps <laughs> life a lot more easy. And the other thing is that countries always trump countries. You, uh, companies, you can be on the side of the angels, but if if U.S. doesn't like Sudan, you're out. So, as we, and in my mind, Western Sahara is the same. <coughs> Some comments on economics. You've got to know your real cost of capital, and it's not 10%. I, I'm for sure it's not 
So debt is your friend, as long as you have enough of it, then you know, and not too much. And for sure, your cost of capital is less than 10%. So we, Townsman, used 8%, but um, that's why we kept acquiring things. And um, we got bigger and bigger. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but you've got to be careful, obviously, with the debt. You must always explore out of equity, develop out of debt. Another discussion, another time, IRRs are a really poor measure of uh, any value generation. I'm a peak oiler. Um, the world consumes 32 billion barrels of oil every year. You looked at the numbers that the RPS guy put up, there's 3 billion, 4, 5 billion. It doesn't go anywhere close to it. <coughs> People can talk about uh, shale gas, and we'll come on to it, but uh, sure, a lot of the increase in U.S. production is shale liquids, which is C5s. The world does not use C5s. And the price, my friend Todd tells me, that in Texas, uh, condensate is $30 a barrel. Okay, and, and I was very pleased to see that the cost, oil field cost escalation is 4% 4, 4 above RPI. I am in, uh, on the board of certain companies who won't believe me that there is a, an oil field cost escalation. This, I, this is very important. Commercial new field exploration risk is one in 20. They tell you it's one in six, it's not. You can, you can go through all, all the data. Uh, I, don't, I hope there's nobody from Tullow here. I went to look at Tullow recently, the 83% drilling success rate. Those are all appraisal wells. So in 2011, number one was Jubilee. When you look back, Jubilee discovery date, 2007. Wait a minute, something's going on here. <coughs> so, Expiration risk is one in 20. It's a risky business. So uh, another way of thinking about risk, and I won't go into it, there, there is, you know, source, uh, seal, reservoir, trap, in wrong order. Four things can go wrong. If two of them are wrong, yeah, it's okay. Three of them wrong, stop. That's, so that's what I used to do. So 50-50, 50-50. So if it's less than half, quarter, if it's less than a quarter, don't do it. And uh, that was successful. Deep water, you addressed it today, uh, and in my mind, somebody mentioned the lower tertiary. There's a lot of oil in the lower tertiary, and it's going to stay there, in my mind. Um, we can talk about uh, deep water technology another time. It, it exists, or it's coming, um, and we another time for that. But uh, shale gas, which is I'm going to talk about, you, to make shale gas work, you need a lot of moose pasture. Canadians will understand what a lot of moose pasture means, and I'll, I'll show you. So why, why are we doing all this? Um, the shareholders are rewarded by share pricing improvement and growth. In my mind, management should be as well. You can make management's richest crisis as long as it's in shares. It's no good ripping money out of the system, as happens in the UK, and, and be you know, share poor and, and cash rich. That's, not, that's wrong. In Canada, people mortgage their house and, and um, start companies. Okay, and uh, you know, it's a, a, a uh, it's parallel with that is if di dividends signal that you're growth stopping. So you've got to reward in dividends or growth, and if, you, if you're not growing, then you pay dividends. Uh, in the US, share price correlates with reserves per share and production per share. Not tr as far as I can tell, it's not true here, because Enquest should be worth a lot more. Um, here, they like lottery tickets, and people lie. Right, so um, I'll move on to shale because this is really where the, the drift of it is. First, of, uh, it is the US is 40 times the land area of the UK. So they've got a lot of room to play. Uh, I, I, two BCF per day is some, something to think about, which is 20% uh, of UK demand. The famous shale uh, unconventional plays in the US uh, is the Barnett. It produces five bees a day. There are 16,500 wells plus another 2,500 permitted. The Barkin isn't really a shale play. It's got a little silty member. It produces from a silty member. It's what we call a halo oil. So the, the, it, it's um, priced in by $100 a barrel. It's not, un it's not unconventional other than its low rate. Um, but the one I want to talk about is the Eagle Ford, which is the poster child. Uh, that's 8,000 square miles, 3,500 wells, 217 rigs, and it produces two BCF per day. 
So if you want the, the, to reproduce the Eagle 4, which you probably for your 2 BCF per day, you're going to have 8,000 miles, square miles, 3,500, well, 200 rigs drill. It's not going to happen. Okay, so the, the, you know, there's 4,500 permits in 2012. This is moose pasture. You've got to have a lot of moose pasture to um, drill up shale gas, you know, and the Lake District just doesn't hack it. This is what's when it's drilled up. This is the Barnett. This is what it looks like. And, uh, I, you know, I put it to you, we'll never, never see that, I don't think, anyway, see that in the UK, even if it works. This is a fracking collection. There are 50 trucks there. Uh, it's, it pumps 10,000 tonnes of water, um, etc. I don't think there are this many uh, pumper trucks in the UK. So a typical frack size in Canada is 5,000 feet horizontal, 1,000 tonnes of propent, 70, there's the 10,000 tonnes of water, plus biocides, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, of itself, is harmless. It's what you do with the flowback. The, the, Alberta's the most fracked place on Earth, maybe close to Texas, I don't know, and they're just fine, thank you. So the, all this fracking goes on at sub, you know, eight, 10,000 feet, and the, the aquifers are up at a few hundred. They don't talk to each other. Um, George Mitchell took 18 years to make the Barnett work, so the chances of uh, it working here instantly are low. Okay, this is, I'm get a little bit more technical. The unconventional basically exploits the, exploits the source rock rather than conventional traps or seal, etc. Talked about halo oil. Um, I think the thing that really makes it work in the US is that the landowner gets the royalty. So we used to drill a lot of wells in the US. They'd say, come along in, knock the top off, make a nice flat pad here so we can put a house on later. And if you find something, we get the royalty. So the landowners would welcome people in. Um, here, it's not. They're talking about where to divvy up the spoils before they've started drilling. OK. Um, so another important point is shale is a size classification, not a mineralog mineralogical classification. You need very low uh, V clay, and I'll come on to that in a minute. T max appears to be uh, a critical uh, thing. Overpressure is very, very good, and obviously thick is good. The basic thing is to frack something, it's got to be brittle, and to be brittle, it has low V clay. So it's got to, which, which is measured quite easily by Poisson's ratio. So you go from glass at 0.5 to mud at 0.2 or something. Okay. Uh, just another picture of uh, the Barnet. And then I can contrast all that with Quadrilla. Here, they're getting into all sorts of trouble trying to permit one well where the other people are doing 5,000 a month. So this, this is just for interest. The, people are going to protest, they'll fight. You know, it's, there's not, there's, the political will is not there for um, the sort of density of drilling that's required for shale gas. Now, some technical points. I'll, I hope um, uh, people can see that. But these are the important things. Uh, TOC. Uh, porosity, sort of, uh, water saturations, uh, un, un, um, exceptional. <coughs> Permeability, we're, we're talking hundreds of nanodarcy. And uh, as, as I will put up later, the average gas molecule over 10 years travels one meter. Okay. Um, so um, the hardness, um, the Poisson's ratio is the important thing. You need a low Poisson's ratio so it fractures. Not, doesn't uh, deform like mud, and it's becoming increasingly, so the water gradient's 0.4, 0.43, something like that. These things are overpressured. And so you can, you can in your mind, the uh, source rock burps out hydrocarbons. It's, uh, at, normally it's a pressure and it'll migrate. In the uh, shales, it doesn't migrate, it stays there. So if you have a prolific source uh, shale rock, uh, uh, shale, it'll be overpressured. Fractures 
uh, play into it, uh, but uh, which I won't bother with now. And obviously, thick is good. So this goes just makes the point about the mineralogy. All those good places, Eagle Ford, Horn River, etc., are, are, are very low clay, and it doesn't really matter whether they're silicates or carbonates, as long as long as they have very low. This also for your later perusal, this is a horizontal well with 10 uh, uh, frac points. So this is done, we use a company called Packers Plus. It's uh, got a tapered string and you put balls down and it fracks each bit uh, in turn. With, as I've said, maybe a thousand uh, barrels of water per frac. The point about uh, these unconventional wells, they decline very, very fast. So you can see it goes from 250 barrels a day to 50 within a year. This is from uh, a company I'm uh, involved in. This is a Montney. It, uh, the last one was liquids. This goes from 3.5 million cubic feet per day to under a million in two years. So they decline very, very fast. And they're unpredictable. So this is a picture of the uh, initial production, four-month average IP, drilled by Shell in Western Canada. Nothing. There was no learning here whatsoever. It's all random. It's a crapshoot. Okay. And I put these up for people's perusal later. Um, the rate versus ultimate recovery, maybe. Uh, Production, initial production, uh, is there any learning over time? No. Uh, frac size versus ultimate, no. Uh, peak month gas events against ultimate recovery, no. So people really don't understand uh, at the moment what's going on. As we, it's, we're in a geological building, shales are as variable as any other depositional environment. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And in detail, people don't know. Again, the important thing is that you, have, uh, as um, Brian Hep would understand, B is the important thing here to know whether your well is going to flatten out, i.e., hyperbolic or exponentially decline. The only reason that the, it works in North America is because they're hyperbolic, not exponential. This is what I was uh, saying gas molecule movement in shale is on <laughs> the order of 10 feet in the lifetime of a well, etc., etc., etc. Um, uh, a meter per year, etc. Right, that's just a second. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so what about that is you get, you pile decline upon decline and eventually you can't offset the decline rates and so the thing peaks, a, a bit like conventional oil. So the projections of U.S. domestic production going, you know, forever, it's just rubbish in, in my mind because it's composed of these high decline wells. And here, they, this is uh, the EIA's uh, projection. Um, they've got deep water Gulf of Mexico, as I say, in my mind, maybe. Anyway, the, the lower 48 onshore tight oil is C5, and they, people don't use C5, don't consume C5. That makes the same point. So what happens? For companies doing unconventional, the debt piles up, the, the approved reserves go up, so they made a sh make a shed load of money, but the, sh the actual shareholders' equity dives through the floor. I find this is, a, for me, very, very powerful. This is energy return on energy invested. Okay, so in the good old days, like in year 2000, a gas well would make mm, 35 times the gas production would be contain 35 uh, times the energy that it required to drill the well. According to this plot, by about 2014, it takes as much energy to get out as you produce. Ceteris paribus, it means it's uneconomic if everything's properly priced, but they're not, not properly priced, so you, know, you, you do have people limping along, but uh, I'll bet Quadrilla never makes any money, for example. Okay. 
Um, this, this is a slide showing how many wells you need to know what you've got if you're drilling up a new shale, uh, uh, for example, a Boland shale. The, uh, you need to drill at least 20 to 25 wells and test before you get any feel for the play at all. So the chance of doing that with one well <coughs> is nil. And, and um, in conventional plays, you can do that. One, two, three, okay, let's go. <coughs> You can't do that with Shell. So, that's what I intended to say. So. <laughs> so, I'm happy to answer questions anytime. Jim, one, one question. There's a, what you described in Shale is a huge range of uncertainty and people making decisions. So you're sitting in the boardroom and the company comes to you and says, okay, we're gonna start drilling for shale. And you say, well, how much money do you have? Or do you have expertise? Well, um, the, the, this, I didn't, there's a lot of stuff on here. The decision making in shale is um, very complicated. And wait a minute, in fact, here it is. <laughs> so, so it's totally different from the top, conventional decision making, from unconventional decision making. The, ba the, the, and the basic thing is, for you've got to know what, it's a Bayesian thing, what pot are we sampling from? With conventional, it's not Bayesian. Un uh, unconventional, it's very Bayesian. And so you have to reduce, so you have to go a long way, a lot of, spend a lot of money on the pilot before you take the decision to go commercial. When you go commercial, you just shut your eyes and do it. Any other questions for Jim? Rattled through. This is uh, Jim Bucky style. This is what a chairman of your company could be. <laughs> Victoria. Sorry, I don't need the mic. I just, so, uh, is your conclusion that there will not be a, a, a commercial shale industry in the UK? Yes, it is. And, and I base that on two things. One, I don't know enough about the shale. Is V clay low? I'm not sure anybody knows that. So it, 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 in the US, the, the whole of the US is, is basically a sedimentary basin with clay, shale, right? And it works here and there, here and there. And the US is 40 times bigger. So the chances of it, and it works in three places in the, Marcellus, four places. So um, chance of it working in the UK are low. Is, does the Boland shale have low V clay? I don't know. Do they know? I doubt it. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Then I, I think the... Um, the number of wells, in order to make it a any difference at all, the number of wells you've got to drill at you know, a million, less than a million cubic feet per day and declining is huge. 20% of the UK production is 2 BCF per day, right? 2,000 million. So you, you're going to have 2,000, you have two, a continual renewed 2,000 wells. I don't see it happening. You don't have the rigs. They've got 219 rigs, as I show. They don't have the pumper trucks. They don't have access. They don't have anything. So, so uh, it's a nice idea, but even if it works, I don't think so. Who? 370 TCF, 500 TCF. So, so if you how multiply... How do you, how do you break into that? Okay, so, so I, th I, I almost rest my case. The fact is it's politicians and, edit and journalists who are who's pumping it up. You don't get, where's Shell? Where's BP? Where's Exxon? Where's Total? No, they're not there because you know, they, they're smarter. In, incidentally, um, it, so, so it's a saviour in the US, but I, here... I think the politicians are grabbing on it as a, a sort of lifeline, but I, I don't think it's real. You don't hear, and Quadrilla, and you don't hear them talking about it too much. And I guess, you know, I, I don't want to sort of 
bad mouth anybody around here. But, um, th they're a long way from any production, let alone any commercial production. I'd make one other point. Poland has very large sedimentary basins with clay. It doesn't work. So lots of companies, Canadian and other people, have, have been there, know what they're doing. It's, the clay is too high. You can't frack it. So Hungary is the same. So uh, my view, Ch maybe China, maybe Russia. Vaca Muerta in Argentina works. It's a brittle shale. And uh, Carnarvon Basin in Northwest Shelf. Stop. I don't think, well, I don't think, I couldn't, you know, I can't answer for all of France because they're not allowed to, <laughs> <laughs> they stopped it and there's a big landmass, but, um, uh, and maybe there's some shells there that you can frack, but broadly speaking, I don't see it. Cause, uh, you know, it's a population density, it's a depth of history, it's a availability of equipment. I mean, Texas has, has got, I don't know how many rigs, 2,000 rigs, land rigs, you know, and how many has the UK got, 10? I'll just so many behind yeah. the Do you not think it's a bit uh, too premature to be saying that there isn't going to be any economic return from it, uh, given that back end has taken 10 years to get to now and won't be economically exporting it until 2016 at least? Uh, you kind of listened to what I was saying there. So the, um, I doubt whether the fracks work. Uh, the return on uh, energy return is getting lower and lower. Um, in I, I do have in here, I, I said Brian had told me I should show it. This, this is uh, drilling in the US, right? Uh, it, they, take, they drill to 12,000 feet in 15 days, right? Do you know anybody in the UK can do that? Offsh offshore, 70, 80, 90 days. You know, uh, millions of pounds. So Black Swan, a company I'm associated with, we try to keep it below six million dollars, Canadian dollars per fracked well and tied in. So, you know, I just don't see it. Um, the, only, the only good is the sign, if you like, is the price of gas here is pretty high. At uh, eight or ten dollars per MCF, you can get away with a lot, but uh, I still... Jim, uh, just getting off the shale for a moment. Um, you mentioned the lower tertiary that the oil would stay there. Were you referring to the Wilcox trend? Or? No, no, deep water Gulf of Mexico. But, but that is the Wilcox okay, trend. Okay, well, uh, that's what I had yeah. in mind. Is I I, okay, it's, it's, we probably know by different words then. Okay. Yeah. So deep are, water. They deep are producing from that. Uh, FPSO. So. No, no, uh, well, not where, not where, what about, uh, uh, what's the name, Devon's Jackfield and, and that sort of thing. But I, I'm talking about those wells where the, the well depth, TD, was 35,000 feet. In well, the, right below the... Uh, yeah, 20,000. 20, yeah, 20,000 20, uh, foot water depth. Yeah. You know, and the, the metallurgy doesn't work. It's waxy crude. The, um, and the, the other thing is that uh, fatigue life of steel drops off very fast with high temperatures. So, uh, and you, as people were pointed out, you can't intervene. Uh, I know, uh, was looking at a lot of wells, uh, things in the Gulf of Mexico, where you've got a platform size and you don't put so many wells on it. So you can't drill injectors unless you've got a bigger thing and then it becomes uneconomic. So uh, there's somebody I know who said he's going to not going to he's not going to do subsea to FPSO? He's going to go for a TLP. Then the question is, you know, how big is it TLP? And <coughs> if if it's you know 15 acres, well maybe, but if it's not, not. Yeah, so a question we'd like to do now, Jim. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. I hope okay. Jim's going to stay for a few more questions. I'd like to change the. Uh, <laughs>